We are live. We've got it right on the dots. 10.30 uh. a.m. on the West Coast, 1.30 p.m. on the East Coast, like 3.30 a.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time. Well I don't know what it is, machine. UTC. <laughs> <laughs> What's happening, it's a, fellas? It's a Lionsgate film, The Unbearable Weight of Massive Talent. There you go. Mm. So, so we got that going for us for people that don't know what we were talking about before we got on. Now you get a peek. <laughs> Boom, behind the scenes. Yeah, that Nick Cage movie, The Unbearable Weight of Massive Talent, is great if you haven't seen it. It's perfect for Nick Cage, and I like Nick Cage. I, uh, I got a little bit high and watched it <laughs> and really liked it. And then I told my wife, I was like, we got to watch this movie together. And then we watched it again, and I only got like 35 minutes in the first time. Then I watched it again. I like the whole thing. I'm not sure she fully understood why I told her to watch it. But, yeah, I, uh, I think my wife is a little bit the same. It was an error in judgment. <laughs> she was checking out Instagram about uh, halfway through. Yeah, that was screen kind on. of how my wife was too. But I enjoyed it quite a bit. This is Value After Hours, by the way. Oh, okay. And, uh, yeah. I'm Tobias Carlisle. I'm joined as always by Bill Brewster and Jake Taylor. And the 10. Shout out Let, to y'all. Let's see. Cameroon to Blissey, Georgia, Amsterdam. Amsterdam, Dublin, Caribbean, nice Scotland, Chapel Hill, Columbus, first Amsterdam in the house. It's a pretty city. Townsville, yes. Yeah, the Townsville listener. Shout out to you. Great. Always on. Good to see you. Yeah, man. Townsville, the, the town's so nice they named it twice. Just to let everybody know that it's a town. There you go. Dallas, yeah. Amman, wow. Farmhouse. Got it all. What does Jake think of the Kirkland short squeeze? Mm. Is that a particular type of juice that they have in there? <laughs> yeah, that's Costco's new uh, new special juice they have. Uh, yeah, a little bit interesting to see, but you know, I don't. That's not really my market I, stuff's hard, my, right? My Ballywick, you know. Market. What's what? Uh, what's Kirkland? Are we talking about a mining company? No, it's a home decor uh, type of retail chain. Oh, nice! Isn't it? I'll tell you what. Rent? I'm I'm What's open that? to uh, putting down all of my tickers, and if anybody wants to meme them, I'm not too good for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, that's the only thing that can save us at this point. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, like, really, folks, feel free. Um, you need that need that meme bid bad, huh? That's right. Like, uh, I remember I made a joke about. Uh, somebody memeing one of my stocks and somebody came in and they were like, you're better than that. And at the time I oh, deleted my, no. I deleted my tweet <laughs> back then. Cause I was like, I am better than that. No more. No, <laughs> definitely not better than that anymore. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I'm about to lose all my body weight in the lower half and go full Chamath. Whoa. Yeah. Speaking of which he had a, uh, he had, the, the, he got pasted in an article uh bloomberg article today where they were just pointing Dang. out his leg his leg those. routine they were like <laughs> <laughs> cops not a real muscle <laughs> dude those are pathetic little chicken legs what were well, they saying in the bloomberg article uh, about, about the just, specs like just pointing up? out the performance of those specs uh, yeah. yeah he's gonna be okay he punched out a few hundred million at the top but uh yeah it doesn't look good well not gonna make it not not gonna make it. Maybe uh, don't talk shit about the goat. I mean, come on now. But, How but, many times we got to learn that lesson? But uh, did he time. learn? But did he learn the lesson? The guy made no, a couple hundred million no, dollars. No. Yeah. So what's the real lesson here? Well, how yeah, much does your reputation lesson? cost? I guess two hundred million dollars. You can have it. Yeah, like I look. Adam Newman just raised capital. It's not like this is gonna stop him from doing it again. Yeah, that's a good yeah point. we're definitely not in a bear market when 350 goes to Adam Newman <laughs> to have another you know, go at it. I was kind of thinking about this and I need to watch We Worked and do a little bit of, of uh, like, yeah, uh, my hot take on this, which is completely unvetted and you're welcome for this. Uh, it's worth <laughs> it's worth what you're paying for it, folks, is uh, I'm not sure that Adam Newman uh, wasn't a byproduct of a uh, little bit of SoftBank nudging him. Mm. And I kind of wonder if, I mean, look, you make, you make money when you look like a, a lot of times, not all the time, 
But when you look like a fool making a bet, and I kind of wonder if Andreessen Horowitz actually thinks that the circumstances around Newman, I mean, they must think this, are less bad than Newman himself. You know, to be fair, the timing of that WeWork IPO getting pulled was very unlucky for them. Like, I think they were, they were stretching at the price that they were asking. But if yeah. you had wound that forward 12 months or two years and it had come in the middle of the, the work from home lockdown pandemic, like that thing would have been an absolute monster. Probably it'd get be, it over the finish line, huh? And it it'd looks... be down 95% now, but it would have been, yeah, definitely would have got over, I, I think. And then, you know, now I think with everybody working from home, like the, those WeWork or a WeWork style that's probably very attractive. Like I would like to get out to get the hell out of the house, <laughs> you know, have a, have a workspace that's separate from the house. Kids are going back to school. You won't matter. That's right. In, in that's right. Bit. The brain damage will be over in about a few days, yeah. two weeks. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Andreessen Horowitz last I checked is not stupid. So um, I'm just, I, they must be seeing something that the rest of us don't. The, the, the risk is that, it's a good idea, and he knows how to execute at a very at, at that sort of scale, right? Like he can take three hundred and fifty million dollars and turn it into a lot of money. What if this time Probably he worked. actually elevates human consciousness? That'd be dope. That's a right tail outcome that you're not. That you're not would counting be dope. On. That's right. That was a little bit. It was all getting a little bit messianic at the end, there, wasn't it? Yeah. I mean, the dude's out there. <laughs> oh yeah. But there's I mean, a walking fine line between New York City streets is that's right out there. Yeah, that is. That's not genius. That's just dangerous. <laughs> just, just giving the uh, that's just the old you, immune system a checkup. That's how you get hepatitis. Yeah, that's the best. You think somebody at uh, Andrews and Horowitz called him up and was like, "Dude, if you like, if you get cut by glass and die of some New York City disease, like this investment sucks for us." Put some fucking shoes on. That's key man risk. Get you some toe shoes. Yeah, get some Allbirds. You shoes. can be a hippie. Don't worry about it. Uh, I don't know. Um, before we got on, we were talking about is this is this is this market quiet? Is it boring? What's everybody else saying? I kind of think it's. Is it the summer malaise? Is it like that's? Is it boring? Is it quiet? And is the reason the summer malaise, or is it because we're in that part of the that eye of the hurricane? Yeah. You mean the beginning of the new bowl? <laughs> well, let's talk inning about Inning number it. one. We're in first inning. But yeah, we just had a reset. Now it's go time. <laughs> that wasn't much of a reset. No, it didn't really it was a deck. reset. 20%. It, was a reset. it wasn't even ah. done as much as it was in March 2020. Ah, you got to look below, below the covers, man. <laughs> Some resets, but... Definitely not a system wide. Yeah, but I don't know that a system wide was on the t- like. I don't know. I mean, it's always on the table, but I I don't uh I don't know that that uh I don't know. I expected the big ones to sell off more on the last earnings, so I uh, I have thought mm. that uh that we had lower to go, but I am open to the idea that we don't or we do. <clears throat> Either one will happen. Yeah, it's impossible to know. No one knows. Bird Global scooters are down today, 22%, 50 cents. That's the mm. thing. 51 cents to go. By the way, uh, S&P profit margin dropped to 10.9%. Interesting. So that was always a little bit of a question mark of what are margins going to be doing over the next What did it get out to, 13? Yeah, something like that. It's pretty serious retracement. It's a little bit of giving, giving some back to the lowly employees and... <laughs> Labor. Time to get it back. Capital, <laughs> capital, uh, shut up. hit. Time to raise prices, get our margins back. <clears throat> yeah, those billion, they're really suffering. We got to get that's there. right. There haven't been any space launches in like probably 12 months, right? What a space launch? What do you mean? A space oh, I don't launch? know. I don't know. Like Blue Origin. Uh, like take oh, a new... I watched uh, SpaceX just the other day. It was oh, SpaceX, SpaceX, yeah, government funded. went to the beach, looked north. <laughs> Oh, really? You can see them from your house? Yeah. Well, yeah, from the beach. Yeah. Sick. Yeah, it's cool. Will you send me a video of that next time you see one? Eh, it's not that cool on video. I uh, tried to take it's one. It's like fireworks. But... <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you lose a lot. All right. Fair enough. Yeah. Uh, it was cool, though. I had, like, the countdown, and the kids are watching, and then I was like, okay, it should. we should see it. And then, sure enough, it was, like, going up, and I was like, oh, that's sweet. At night. I want to see one at night. Yeah. 
did you guys see uh, Burry's uh, latest 13F? Yeah, he sold it all, right? He went in on a... Everything except for Geo. Yeah, Tickers which is Geo. what? It's like a prison mental health, yeah, private, private prison mental prison. health. Oof. Good for him. That's dark. <laughs> He's just punched out of every other single thing in the portfolio. Everything, huh? Good for him. Does he? Is that is that outside money or is that just him? I don't know. I have no point. idea. I mean, you would think after watching the big short, you know, how angry all the investors were. And I'm sure he was like, all right, I don't really need this in my life anymore. <laughs> I am not part but then he of could his probably raise a lot of money. List. He, yeah, he could probably raise a lot of money. Yeah, of that was. Uh... He's not following anyone on Twitter. So that's part of the problem. <laughs> No, he does that intentionally. That's part of the allure. The he deletes his tweets immediately. So, yeah. So you just got to follow. Don't follow Burry. For it. Follow the Burry archive. Uh, ah, look at you. That is smart. Where is that? Burry archive. A uh, few. If you search those two words, it should come up. It's as if they named it for what it is. It it, it does it does give me a little bit of uh, pause when. Barry, who who called that last uh, nah the reasons for it <laughs> no, just no to way. punch out of every single thing except but it's not it's not so much the selling out of everything like that's whatever like that's that's a little concerning but uh, the uh, going all in on prisons and mental asylums like does that say yeah. something? Yeah, what does that tell you about? I don't know. Hopefully, society. Hopefully he uh, takes a big loss on the position as we decriminalize some of the uh, marijuana uh, convictions. Mm. That would make sense. Retroactively, even though I know some of my conservative friends are screaming at their screen saying, how can you break the law and get away with it? The answer is, I don't care. I saw a study today that says that um, the U.S. has longer prison sentences and fewer police per, I don't know if it's per citizen or per resident of the of the jails and that and a better idea would be shorter prison sentences and more police it's under policing yeah. is the problem is their argument well the u.s uh, is under policing right now yeah under policing it's possible <laughs> i'm sure everyone in rougher neighborhoods is like oh yeah real lot of under policing happening here they've got the statistics i mean i don't know what's true or not it's just the, the, statistically it seems to be true I don't know what it means. I'm not an advocate for either of those two things. But you're trying to lock people up, man. Is that what you're trying to do here? I'm just trying to make sure I don't get locked up, mate. That's the only thing I'm doing. Take it easy there, Spitzer. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, you know. By the the way, uh... I'm running for Attorney General of California. Yeah. (laughs) More police, longer prison sentences. I could see how, like, uh, you could have a theory that social media and what it does to people's minds or, or, constantly being connected to the internet could lead to more mental instability. Like if you were long, uh, some sort of like mental or Prozac. Yeah. I mean, whatever. Yeah. But I, I could see that, uh, if that's part of the prison thesis, I don't know. I don't know about maybe there's just, I mean, I haven't looked into private prisons enough, I guess. I'm sure they're great margins. Oh. There's gotta be a, a better way to make a living. Yeah. Yeah, but that's the beauty of being a passive investor. You don't have to actually go do it. Yeah, no conscience. No. Uh... Munger would advise against it, I think. Yeah, I was just about to say, I don't, I don't see those guys loading up on cigarettes and so on. A young Munger might think differently, but a rich older Munger would say don't do it. Uh, I, my favorite quote of his was when he said something like, uh, we stopped traffic in the, in the really cheap stuff and our returns didn't go down that much. I was like, yeah, that's right. <laughs> hmm. That's that's his that's that's what the rich older monger does. They yeah, want more money. Also, yeah. less trading. I guess that's always nice. Longer. Yeah. What a beast! What else do we have on long. on tap for today? What what do we? Uh, I got something obviously, but what else? Well, Burry was my oh, okay. Burry Chamath. I've also got. I've been watching that ten ten three inversion. It's because I really wanted to be the first one to call it. <laughs> okay. Has it gotten there yet? No, no. It's It's been like, it's because it, it had this, it Just looked like one of you, those, huh? it looked like that Chinese plane flying directly at the, like it, it was scary how fast it was going down. It was directly at the, the inversion. 
and it just like stopped and it's just bumped sideways along the top of the inversion. It's like 0.07 from inversion right now, which means like could be tomorrow. I think I said this for a few, not that it means anything, like it's a completely arbitrary number. And when you look at the rest of that yield curve, it's a funky yield curve. It means yeah. everything. How long does it have to be uh, inverted for it to count? Is it just just the tip and it counts? Just or is the tip it... and it counts, yeah. Okay, fair enough. Never, never play that. Here anyway. Go. A good comment, Iggy. Private prisons are counter-cyclical because their use increases when governments have to cut costs by privatizing prisons. There we go. Thank you. Bang. Put 100% of your portfolio in it. First of all, good comment. Thank you. Holbury. Yeah. The I, I do year, like the 30-month, three-month run. Yeah. Yeah, the 10-3 is the Cam Harvey. Is what Cam Harvey did his research on. So 10 2 went through a while ago. 10 2 is really deep. 10 3 is not even not, not there yet. But then you can look at the whole yield curve. Like it's just, it's an arbitrary number. The yield curve is, is in a funky shape at the moment. 10 year and three month money being opposite of that is just kind of crazy it, to imagine, isn't it? I mean, they're basically the same at the moment. You're getting like roughly close to 3% on each. Wow. <laughs> just, there's it's, just. It's, you there's can Google no... like Google the Treasury yield curve, and there's there's sites out and there. And it just shows popular. you like a Picasso picture. Yeah, three month, five years, pretty close too. I look at I, you can you can look at and I've I've got a site that compares it. You can compare you can pin today and compare it to any other date or compare any date to any date, and it's just crazy to see how much it's moved over the last twelve months. Like it's all up as you'd imagine because the interest rates are up, but also the front end is way up. Yeah, there's a lot of distress out there. Mm -hmm. But it's all good within 10 years, I guess. Well, as long as the 10-year the and the three months stay 0.07% away from each other, it hasn't technically crossed, and so it's okay. But like it's so close that it's practically, it's practically there. <laughs> it's already there already. <clears throat> mm, you could taste it. Well, yeah. Like I, you know, I don't know. I was saying before we came on, I, I think um there's some interesting debt out there. I, I don't, I mean, this is not what I do. And I'm sure I would be negative alpha in credit land. So uh, no need to pay attention to anything that's about to come out of my mouth. But like, I'm pretty sure Transdime has some uh, bonds that are trading. Like you get paid five, five, and I think they yield six to maturity. Mm. I mean, I, you know, if that's a, uh, that's remotely close to the truth and they go out to 2027 like that's kind of interesting shut up bloomberg uh also uh like the 2027s uh or like uh charter i was looking at what are what are these things hang on let me pull these up because they're like you can go out to 2042 and i think you're making six percent uh, do you have a coupon. bloomberg yeah how do you get access to a bloomberg i don't know you just fucking pay uh um 648 uh, 2045s. Uh, I mean, that's, I don't know. I can understand not liking the equity, but the debt seems like you should get paid back, but I'm a, I am a bag holding charter bull. So what's the no reason mind. for the, uh, why is it down? I just, I think, uh, I think that it all traded off with when rates went up. Right, I, think, I think you get like a yeah. shot to actually get paid to take a debt risk now. Where does inflation, like once we get through this sort of, there's clearly some, there's some uh, cyclical component to the inflation, right? So that comes off at some point. Does it settle below that yield? Yeah, I think probably. You're not doing the thing where you, you, you send out a hundred burgers worth of money and you get back. 90 burgers worth of money in a few years time i mean you might but that's uh you know i don't know what do you want to do you want to take 20 risk to avoid that like i'm not i'm not sure too many places are safe we were talking about this before we came on like i think it's hard to it's hard to be excited about anything at the moment because i don't think anything looks super cheap and i don't think anything looks super good either so we're sort of in this funny it's all a little bit blah that's what kind of why i like i like I like JT's blah thesis where it's the, the summer malaise or the boring market. I've got, yeah, that's, I'm, I've coined it the, the boring twenties. Yeah. <laughs> oh, damn. I that's mean, good. Yeah. The boring twenties. I like it. 
you know, I don't know if uh, if you think that Morningstar is any good at what they do, which free not to. A lot of a lot of four star stocks. There were a lot of five star stocks. They've moved. They moved a little bit, but you know, there's some interesting stuff on these lists. All a matter of figuring out which ones are worth betting on. They they've got an aggregated market level valuation tool that they use. I think that they aggregate all of the the stuff that they cover to come up with a level of the market valuation. What's it say? I was wondering if Bill had it there. No, I don't have it up. Is it still a bear market rally if S and P makes new all time highs? No. Yeah. When I just said it's a new bull. <laughs> <laughs> literally just said that when do you call a new ball does it have to go past the old all-time high uh i don't know i don't think so because if you were measuring it you probably say from the bottom to the to the peak run i have, i think you just need a i think you need a couple higher highs and lower and higher lows hmm. you definitely got to take out the, the old technician high, right? to be to be a new ball i don't think so do you uh well well, I guess it depends on your time frame. Yeah. It could it be a so. long term sideways with a short term bull. I don't know. Mm. It's all a little bit bullshit, isn't it? It is. It's all just a lot of hate. Doesn't matter. <laughs> just names. My man Bill, he thinks uh he thinks we're going to the highs. I mean, who knows? Could be could be all time highs, could be all time lows. We don't know. Could be well, sucker rally. Who knows? You can the call reason, it, and like whatever happens, you'd be right. But no yeah, one knows. I think uh, I think Bill is a data driven dude. That he goes by Wabufo on the Twitter machine. I think people should follow him. He's interesting. He follows monetary plumbing, and uh, when things were selling off, he was he was talking about how high tax receipts were, and that we were actually running a governmental surplus, and how that was phantom tightening. And now we've switched to deficits again, which means reflate, baby. Mo bubble. I mean, isn't it concerning to anyone else that it's how much government policy, like that kind of stuff is what drives this no. as opposed to like, what are the no. businesses doing? And <laughs> what's the, it's all just this liquidity game in, in this particular uh, view of the world. Yeah, that's right. Liquidity is always, always has a short-term been. answer, right? Uh, yeah, always but, has been. Liquidity or market animal spirits, like probably it's liquidity driving animal spirits, and then and over time it becomes a weighing machine. But in the short term, it's always liquidity. Yeah, flows. but then like flows. Yeah, then you get you know the populations get older and people get wealthier and there's more people that are in the capital markets and like I don't know I just think uh, I don't know. I think I Buffett think, was born at the right time. That's true. I think he'd be fine anyway, but I think he was born at the right time. Ah, you're going to be okay. One way or the other. Who, me? Everybody. Not me. <laughs> Not everybody else. I'm going to be sucking my thumb. Not, not going to make it. That's right. <laughs> Do we want to debate that thing that you sent around, the 250-year uh, the investment? Yeah, we could do that. That's a interesting. It was uh, Bloomstrand put out a tweet where he uh, asked for what would you pick if you had to choose something to hold for 246 years, I believe, which I think takes you back to 1776. So I think that wasn't an accident uh, as to why he selected Chris, 246. He's thoughtful. Uh, so you have to hold it for 246 years from today. Uh, you know, who, who's your fighter? And, you know, it was a, uh, you know, you had a bunch of the obvious choices like S and P 500 or, uh, the dollar gold, the Euro, uh, what else was in there? Like any, any treasury, um, kind of got to pick who, whatever you wanted, but you know, what was going to be the best outcome for a really, you know, long time horizon. what do you got for that bill? I'm taking the S and P. I could be I could be talked into some sort of uh, all world index. That's fine, but I'm taking some index, and I think I'd take the S and P. I think the index is a strong choice because of the 
uh, the malleability of it and the ability yeah. to rotate into whatever's working um, at that time. So that makes sense that it does seem like a good choice. I do wonder about the US part of it. And my, my argument is that if we went back and rewound the clock 246 years and looked at, you know, what would you have picked at that time in this same scenario? Uh, the United States was a, you know, basically like war torn emerging market and you would have civil war yeah yeah you would have definitely picked the british empire to bet on at that point uh Ah, gangly teeth in a small island no way dude they were the g's at that point i mean they were Ah. worldwide the sun never sets couldn't even beat us and we didn't even have a country losers (laughs) so if we if we fast forward to today you know which are you betting on uh, you know, a similar, you know, British empire that is the U S today. Uh, and is that a little bit of recency bias in your, your selection of, of the S and P? Yeah. VT is the answer, right? Could be, huh? Get the whole own all the world's businesses, basically whatever may happen. Everybody's got that home country bias. Meb, Meb favorite would be Thing we're all over allocated to our home country. The thing is, the S and P is multinational, so I'm just not sure that you're as home country bias as I, I don't know. I need so to know. Was how the to British rule. Empire was pretty multinational. Yeah, but they they're a small little island. <laughs> okay, I think I think. Uh, I don't know, man. I'd want to be in North America and I'd want to have multinationals uh, until, you know, I guess if we run out of all of our natural resource advantage, all right, this has to go away. Uh, then um, then maybe I'm wrong, but by then I'm probably dead. And I figured my kids, uh, no my cop- kids are probably no dead. out with the, you know, we're all dead thing. You, you got to think multi-generationally. Yeah, well, that's, I'm, I, I mean, that's why I picked the index. Gee, it's just, we've got a couple of good ones in there. AMC from Keith Harmon. Matt Hansen says Geo. <laughs> Dude, I'll tell you what. Uh, have you seen what Bed Bath & Beyond is doing today? Or no, is it Bed Bath & Beyond? Yeah, I think it I is. I saw Kyla Scanlon had a good um, tweet where she, she did a sum of the parts valuation. She had bed, whatever it was, 10 bucks, bath, 10 bucks, beyond infinity. Ooh. There you go. That's your, that's your valuation. Yeah. I mean, the math checks out. <laughs> What a what a beast! Up seventy five percent today, I think seventy point four percent. Good. What for is it. happening there? Is that just a short squeeze? Uh, yeah, the AMC thing gives me. I just because I, I I follow um I follow uh, Cliff Asness, and you know they've got like he's got a twelve basis point short on GME. Oh, sorry, AMC as part of a huge portfolio of shorts, but he talked about it. Yeah. And so he, the, the and so now he's, yeah. Come so now he's the billionaire short who has become the face of uh, the squeeze, the other side of AMC. And oh, that, that's funny. That Twitter account. Oh my god, just the 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 it's shellacking trial. that he's yeah. taking, like the brand damage for that position. But I, I feel like the AMC guys. Like I don't know how many AMC people are listening to this. Probably not many. But what is you doing, baby? That that is. <laughs> See, Cliff thrives on that kind of that vitriol. Like that's that's energy for him. Like he's a he's a vampire. Yeah, he does. Yeah, so he's yeah. just fine with it. He's enjoying it. Like the, to yeah. watch him argue with, like he's just he's just, just rational and eggs. making the argument. But they're just <laughs> they're insane. I think that because like, there's no value. Right? There's nothing going on there. Like ugh, it's brain damage. Uh, I can't, I can't imagine being short. Coming out. <laughs> Duh. That's the argument. <laughs> it's got to be. But it's as good as anyone up. they'll come up with. Here's the thing, dude. There's a, the, that 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 gold mine. You know, for all we know, gold rips and AMC becomes a gold miner. Be hilarious. And gold mine I with mean, a cinema attached. And you got a CEO that's done some stuff in his life. I mean, that's true. But I uh, not where I would put my money, and I'm yeah. not rooting for any of them. The, Especially the, that woman, terrible. The shorts in that stuff, just the the brain damage from shorting stuff that moons like that, just 
We criticize by category, Bill. I don't miss it. No, anymore. no, not her. Not her. <laughs> criticize by name. It's fine. <laughs> I, I don't I don't follow it all. I don't I don't know. I, I can't I've seen the handle around, but I don't know what she does. JT, do you want to give I think us a she has children? Here? Those are the real victims here. Oh yeah. You send all the uh, hate mail to straight to Bill there. Yeah. Send it to me. I'll <laughs> debate you guys on AMC. Bill Dumbassery. On also <laughs> you, you haven't seen the debate. You don't know where that debate's gone. The debate is not, it's not a debate on the merits, mate. I mean, the thing that's nice is if you start to debate people like on Twitter, if, if you say something and then they come in, it's just like a, you can mute so many people at once. It's like such a good way to thin out the bad brains of the world. Mm. If you want engagement, like that's how you get engagement, put those sort of tickers in and then take a position and like strap in. Yeah, I but guess. then oh, the engagement, the engagement, like, is fun for the first day or so, and then the third day, I'm like, oh, okay, I'm over this now. I've yeah, and you're fun. like, Jesus, these people actually live for this stuff. What was I thinking? They're just an un. There's this unlimited wave prepared to storm the beach. Yeah, over a theater company. It's amazing, and GameStop too. Somehow they've been persuaded that it's like there's some vast conspiracy on the other side. Yeah, man. I think uh, this is, you know, cabbage. You would think mind. you would think the Internet would make people smarter. Like in, in theory, you'd say we're going to come out with this thing that has all the world's information and we're going to get smarter from it. Turns out everyone got dumber. Yeah, it just allows you to um, find more support for your own views. Yeah, I yeah. am right. Everyone com. got more confident, but not, yeah. but their predictive ability did not improve at the same rate as their confidence. There's a good I would Darwin argue quote about that. Maybe their predictive ability went down. Probably could be. All right, we ready for hit us, JT. A, it's a good palate cleanser because this is uh, about AQR, and, and Cliff had a, a piece. I think it came out last week uh, that was called is value just an interest rate bet. And that's something that's been a topic that's come up a lot. As, we've talked about it a lot. Yeah. We've talked about it a lot. And so here's some actual like real research as opposed to us just, you know, kind of shooting off the hip, but uh, you know, there's this, this commonly heard logic that, you know, growth stocks have these longer dated cash flows than value stocks. And therefore that longer duration means that they just move more with long-term interest rates. And, you know, it's kind of makes sense. There's some, some logic to it uh, on first blush, uh, you know, like there's this pile of money at the end of the rainbow and it's discounted less uh, than when rates drop and therefore the net present value is higher. So um, I think we've maybe we've all taken turns being, you know, arguing for that <laughs> particular viewpoint. Uh, but the first thing that Cliff does to unpack this is he looks at the rolling five-year monthly correlation between the Fama French value factor returns and then the U S 10 year treasury yield. So basically you know, value returns, uh, academic value returns versus tenure. And what do those look like? And he goes back to 1930 and the average correlation is around 10%. Like it's, it's trivial. Um, so the first thing is like the data doesn't support this argument that, that rates and value are, are interlinked. Uh, but then if you look at around 2010, it kind of starts to, to connect together and, you know, it, that correlation increases materially up to like 50 or 60%. It kind of moves around, but um, so there's some recency bias potentially in this argument um, that, that shows that, you know, if you've only looked at the last 10 years, it does kind of look like interest rates and value are correlated pretty a lot tighter than they have been. So, you know, whether that persists or not is kind of the million dollar question that, that is, you know, you try to figure out. Um, so, what about like growth assumptions in this whole thing? Um, he has, uh, Cliff says that by definition, growth stock investors believe their portfolio will outgrow value stocks. And they're right. On average, using our very diversified global value factor to sort stocks, the expensive ones outgrow the cheap ones by about 4% a year over the next five years. This is the fundamentals of them. Yeah, this is the, the right. This is the, the, the fundamentals of the, value versus growth and, uh, you know, where, do, what kind of growth do they actually, what actually materializes. So, and, and what he, Cliff says is that most of that actually comes in the first two years, uh, which he says is where the majority of the, any predictability seems to reside. And then after five years, it's basically a push. There's no excess growth from year six onward between value and, and growth in their data sets. So, uh, and, and he shows this 
this graphic of a, a 10% growth rate for 50 years. So it's this like, you know, just super in, you know, curve that just takes off. And, you know, he, he says that this is what growth investors think that they're buying, uh, you know, and, and you have this like, and I mean, it's, it's a, he calls it a unicorn, like it absolutely just, you know, crushes obviously, but, uh, but he says what they're actually buying is more of like this 4% excess growth at the beginning for five years. And then basically, equaling out with the value portfolio. And so he shows these two, like, you know, what they think they're buying versus what they're actually buying. And I mean, it's an order of magnitude difference on the, on the Y axes that show, you know, how much, you know, it's like, it goes from like $1 to like $140 at year 50 for the, for the, uh, you know, 10% for 50 years. And the other one's at like $12, right? So this huge difference. Um, so basically, uh, he says that, you know, he had, he has kind of one last thought that he says that he says he doesn't find that low interest rates justify super cheap value versus growth prices. Uh, but he can't argue with the idea that a 40 year bond rally, uh, particularly in real rates has raised equity prices more generally. It, he just said it shouldn't change the relative equity prices between diversified value and diversified growth more than a, a tiny bit, if at all. So, you know, he, he says that, you know, there's some kind of like reflexivity in this and that like if people think that that is true, it will sort of show up in that short term voting machine type of uh, approach. But there's no fundamental reason why this this tighter correlation should continue. And the historical data, if it if it mean reverts, would, would show a decoupling between rates and, and value. So I uh, thought that was a it's a nice little short piece that is uh actually d dives into the numbers and the statistics behind this argument and, and does a pretty good job of debunking it, I think. I had, I read the paper that his colleagues produced when it first came out a few years ago, and uh, Cliff said at the time that he thought that there was a little bit more support for the argument than they were showing in that, in that paper, because the paper, they looked at the, the, the shape of the curve, the level of the curve, different types of rates, couldn't find anything that gave any predictability. Uh, yeah. There was no um, coefficient. There was no, there was nothing, there, there was no relationship basically they could show. And he, he said, I think that this, I think that I can show one with the sort of brute force method, but he didn't ever, he didn't ever publish a paper. And I guess this is the thing that he's come out with, which is kind of more of a blog post than a. Yeah. It's not a real full like research paper. It's more of a, more of a blog post. Cause I find that, I find the the argument pretty compelling. Like the the argument that backdated back end cash flows are more sensitive to to interest rates in in growth stocks than value stocks, which are all front end loaded. That makes much more sense to me. I wonder where you priced the book as the as the metric because it's you know there are other cash flow metrics that you can pull out of that Fama, or there are other flow metrics that you can pull out of Fama French, which makes more sense to me compared to an interest rate than a mm -hmm. than book value, but yeah, kind of a ten-year yield would probably comp more to a, a cash flow yield, right? For a for a company, it's like like flows. I would have thought, but then there's also that research that shows that the you know the the Fed model, which is basically the the rate, it's it's the the yield minus the rate, and whenever there's a whenever there's a a, a big premium, that sort of indicates that there's going to be some good returns to to equity, but there's no relationship either in that. So maybe that. That, that won't yield anything better either. I mean, one thing <sighs> he does hard. say is that uh, it's possible that this is just randomness and we're just, we all try to like find answers in randomness. <laughs> we're pattern making creatures, right? There's, there's also just the case that low, low interest rates or interest rates that are below whatever sort of the natural rate, I hate saying the natural rate because whatever that is, but below the natural rate, like you do get these periods of, there are lots of these periods of mooning, tech type stocks or growth, whatever the, whatever the meme fad of the day yeah. happens to be electronics Radios or, whatever. or TVs or yeah. railroads or the telegraph sure. in 1840 steamships in 1825, whenever the new technology comes in, there's this massive amount of excitement about it. All of this money flows into it. Most of it's shredded, but for a period of time, it looks like it's working it's sort of Soros reflexivity, but I don't know if that's a, if that's due to the rates or if that's just excitement over a new sort of area of business.
hard to know. It feels like a very meme stock. Like it's it's hard to believe that this whole thing is over with meme stocks running the way that they are. <laughs> is that you your, uh, is that on Jeremy Grantham's checklist of you know bubble behavior is like meme stock? Uh, there's probably like there's probably some word for it, right? whatever the whatever the the popular stock of the retail day. enthusiasm was probably what he would call it, right? Retail enthusiasm, perfect. Something like that. Yeah. I don't know that I buy that it's retail. Uh, definitely the apes, but I don't. I, there's a lot of money behind some of these moves. I, I'm not sure this isn't like big time hedge fund guys. Uh, Do you think the things. algos like turn into ape like behavior for some reason? Yeah. For sure. Yeah, because I mean, look, uh, if you have a momentum strategy, you have to be long that shit, like depending on what your time horizon is. Right. So, like, I just kind of wonder if some of this, uh, the meme stuff is more of like a market structure thing that people have hacked than it is. Uh, I mean, it's definitely risk seeking behavior. Don't get me wrong. But like, there are a lot of people in the world that don't even view, uh, like, fundamentals is a legitimate way to invest so Depends. for all those yeah <laughs> they're, they're well, that's really right. wealthy ones super retired yeah these are the ones around the beach already well yeah and to be fair like i i think that there's uh there's some view of the world that can laugh at fundamentals and and has a legitimate reason to do it it's not the church i pray to but i i don't i'm not convinced my religion is the only religion momentum's um, very thoroughly yeah. backed by by the research so the, the momentum's a real thing I yeah believe. the issue I, I just don't know uh i mean you would know better than me but like with these memes they happen so quick i i don't know how like momentum strategies catch them i don't think they would i don't think many yeah. of them would i mean i don't know the shorter term stuff but i know that you know one of the one some of the work that the alpha architect guys did was to look at the volatility of the trend so if you have less volatile momentum that's better because that means it's probably just like a long yeah more upward. durable Kind of it's thing. mirroring it's mirroring the underlying growth in the yeah, fundamentals i could do so that i remember jack um telling me at some point that it was uh momentum was the best proxy for for gro- for determining the growth of the fundamentals of that so if you want earnings growth you want mm. then you use the mo- the price stock price momentum will give it to you i mean this is really boring but if somebody came to me and they were like my strategy is 15 stocks uh, high quality, however they want to define it. Uh, and basically I ride them if they're above the 200 day and I sell them if they're below and it's an equal weighted strategy. I'd be, I would be interested to see how that back tests. I, I think that could be a fairly rational way to invest. Didn't, didn't Greenblatt do something like that eventually? I thought he messed around know. with adding a momentum layer to I think that formula. On, a, on an individual stock basis, it's a little bit different. I don't know how it works on an individual stock basis. I think that the, a lot yeah, of the, the momentum problem is stuff you can is... get screwed by gaps, right? You kind of need like diversification so you don't get like gap down Whip by sod. 40% and stuff. I think, you, I think Jesse, um, who's the stock market? Livermore? Go- Livermore, yeah. Livermore looked at it. And uh, the pseudonymous Twitter account, Jesse Livermore looked at it and said... Um, not the original Jesse Livermore from no, not the original one. Okay, yeah, I forget the detail of it exactly, but I forgot I've lost my train of thought. <laughs> Great story. Yeah, cool segment by us. I like that. <laughs> I, I didn't say much because I was thinking the whole time. I think you guys did a good job with that. So well done. Kudos. Credit goes uh, to Cliff for doing all the hard work. I just yeah. I just read what he was saying to you. <laughs> He did another. I mean, he's had a few recently. He's 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 back out uh, arguing for value again because it's at the the ninety seventh percentile, which is also you know where it is, like the it's the second highest reading ever on the spread according to uh, the Alpha Architect EV EBIT um, chart. I, I, Gotta I, capture salad, a lot days are of ahead. commodities in that. I would EV think. EBIT. Yeah. Got to get the flows. I don't know. I, th- I think you got a lot. You think they've been flowing for 12 months? Uh, yeah. When did energy kicked yeah. off at the start of this year, right? Uh, I guess the other yeah. stuff kind of mooned a little bit before then, didn't it? But it's all, has I mean, I bet like trip. shipping's in it. Um, shipping. Yeah, a lot of stuff has. That's why I think the EV has probably come down and your trailing EBIT's quite high. I'm not convinced it doesn't work, by the way. Uh, I just think that's probably a lot of the composition. I mean, we've wondered before if that all of this stuff 
quote unquote value works because it's just almost being macro agnostic, right? Like not having a, a prediction about will this, you know, cycle last longer or not? Like, you know, who knows? That's probably part of the problem with becoming a little bit more experienced as an investor that you start looking Talk at yourself stuff. out all the good ideas. Yeah, they all fall. Like you've seen everything fall apart. Like I've seen everything fall apart now. I just know it's all going to fall apart at some stage, but hopefully not before I get out. The interesting thing I'll about okay. commodities. Well, You're the interesting thing money. about that <laughs> is uh, I, I, uh, everybody wants to rent them. Nobody actually wants to own them. Which, which one, sir? Just generally commodities. All the commodities. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there are so few, like, there's so few people that want to own anything in the market. And then you turn it into commodities. And I think there's even fewer. Um, I I mean, I pay some attention to shipping because Jay, Min, Jay Minsmeyer got me into it. And, like, those balance sheets are going to come out the other side of this in pretty damn good shape. And copper... I mean, if you think that the Inflation Reduction Act is half, you know, look, I, I, the idea that there's not going to be incremental electric vehicle demand over the next eight years, I think, is like a very low probability. And if there was a grain of truth in the mooning that supply is tight, uh, maybe a recession can get all that like figured out. But I think with good balance sheets, we may eventually they'll cycle. Uh, no doubt, everything will. But I don't know, man. We might there may be a higher for longer. Might be a lot of money to be made in between then. Yeah. Well, the funny thing is, like with shipping, I was reading a <clears throat> global ship lease, uh, like their commentary, and uh, I think what they would say is like the backlog is high right it's like 54 percent of the fleet or something like that but when you look at it it's a lot of these really big ships these are container ships that they're talking about and when you look at where they play like basically the entire fleet is currently shipped or currently leased uh they have fixed contracts through like 2023 and there's been like no scrapping over the last two years and you've got environmental regulations which are rolling in so ships are going to have to slow down to comply so you're looking at like a phantom reduction of capacity by five to 15%, just like naturally based on the slow. So even though there's more ships because they're going to be traveling more slowly, it's going to be like yes, it functionally reduces. equivalent to having less capacity. Okay. Correct. And to the extent that like China continues the zero COVID policy, if they're like, a, a big recession would eliminate a lot of the port congestion, but to the extent that there's port congestion that, that continues it t just takes longer for a ship to get where it needs to go. So you have like kind of this phantom capacity reduction. Um, I don't know. They're coming out of the other side of this. They got five unencumbered ships. They're paying down their debt. They've got contracted EBITDA. Uh, obviously that's like a joke in that industry because you have plenty of leverage and plenty of reinvestments, but yeah. it's uh, pretty sure that the D is real on ships as is the I, <laughs> you know, um, but you got an. If you believe in inflation, you do have a, a hedge in the steel. If you had to scrap them, um, I don't know. It's just it's uh, it's one of those things that I could see why on the back end they say, you know what, we don't have to chase the growth because we don't have to service our debt because we have our balance sheet fully repaired and we have unencumbered ships, so we can actually manage the supply side. And if that's the case. This is like, uh, you know, marathon capital cycle theory stuff. You watch supply really tight or really closely. Yeah. And uh, you can have some results that are pretty impressive in some historically shitty industries. Of course, it's a big prisoner's dilemma and they've always fucked you through history. Yeah. <laughs> Lay that bet as you, if you want. Yeah, you're definitely... <laughs> that would be an exception to the the rule of <laughs> capital. But I think it rhymes a little with what Buffett sees in Occidental, right? Yeah, you have I mean, a massive Buffett's free cash putting flow. Putting his his bets down as far as like the sustainability of this, isn't he? Yeah, and I mean, look, I got this theory from Dan. This is not something I came up with. But remember when you, me, and Dan were sitting down, and Dan was like, Buffett likes to see the capital coming back to him. Right. Like he was going through scenarios and like Oxy 
I mean, your front year cash flows are huge and they've committed to not growing production and they've committed to shareholder returns. Uh, I, I kind of see what he's probably seeing. I mean, I obviously don't see what he sees because he's a genius and I'm an idiot. But outside of that, I think I see it. Especially with your glasses on. It's a lot easier to see. No blue light, man. Get those oh, blue okay. blockers. Blue yeah. blockers. Shout out to Twitter. They sent them to me. Do you, do you, do you notice them? Do, they, do you sleep better? I don't sleep well. <laughs> are you, but are my you? eyes are less strained. Okay. Oh. <laughs> anyway. I don't know. Those are my thoughts. There's a lot of there's a lot of commodity like in the in the screens that I run at the moment. There's a lot of commodity stuff around. Now there's a lot of like steel and commodity. And, um, because I've gone through a super cycle already, I've, I'm nervous as hell about that stuff. But that's probably a pretty good buy signal. You flag all those out. Well, who the hell wants <sighs> to own it? You're on the downside, right? Everybody's already made the money. Now it's selling off. Like you got to be an idiot to buy commodities here. Except Damn, maybe that's not. That's my bet signal. <laughs> Except maybe not. Yeah. It's hard, dude. It's, I, I don't know. I think it's just nobody knows. You got to put your chips where the stuff looks cheap. Let it, let it ride. I mean, <laughs> the thing that sucks about, I, I was listening to some oil company talk and they were like, you know, oil services inflation is outpaced oil inflation, right? And that's yeah. like, yeah. that's the sucks. thing that sucks about commodity businesses. Yeah. The margins stay the same through the whole cycle. Yeah. They never get yeah. good because the so annoying. Now you got to pay everybody to go out and work huge rates. You need three hundred thousand dollars for the guy turning the stop sign. Yeah, who's not loyal at all, right? Will jump no matter for the next dollar. So I don't know. I did a little exercise where I looked at uh, let's just say Exxon and Chevron to start, and looked at their book value and just tried to imagine. Okay, when things have been going well for them in previous periods, what kind of ROEs were they looking at? And let's assume that this is going to be a reasonably good period for them. And let's look forward a little bit and try to back into what a, that return on equity would then do to book value. And so kind of a, like a you know, skate to the where the puck is going to be as far as book value. And then when things have been going well, like what has sort of been the multiple that they would get on price to book? And you know, if you run that kind of exercise, you, I think they're still kind of relatively not, not crazy expensive. Um, and there's still, I think some upside to them when you, if you, at least in what my estimation of, of looking through like that. A lot of three-star stocks in the energy space. I've been, I've been just, I was just like scrolling morning star just to see, but I did notice Exxon's three stars. It's what does three stars mean? Like, like mar market perform or something? Yeah. Like not too cheap, but could probably work. Hmm. Do you think Buffett has a view on oil? Does he need to have a view on oil to be buying Oxy where it is? Where does he need the oil price to be for that to work? That's probably a better question. I think this is a really hard question because I don't know how he's thinking about the bet. So if he's thinking about the bet, like it hedges the rest of his book. And even if oil goes like to like, that, I don't know, man. I think he's built his life in a way that's very hedged. He's always thought about downside first. I think people like to say he doesn't, but I think he does. And I think, I think there's probably if if it. But came we're talking out, about two different things. You're saying hedge for the book, and Jake, you're saying downside of the individual name, right? Uh, I think what Bill's saying. Correct me if I'm wrong. Is that that having uh, effectively long oil as a is fits in with the rest of his kind of worldview and the way the rest of the assets are positioned. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think, I think what he probably, I mean, I have no fucking clue, but if I was him, this is what I would see. I'd be like, okay, I'm getting a ton of cash up front and they've committed to not growing production 5% and they're going to give me the cash back. And I'm going to have investment opportunities when that cash comes back to me. So let's say oil goes to 50, like what's my real downside in this bet? And then if oil does go on some run, I'm going to have a bunch more cash to deploy in a scenario where a lot of stocks are a lot cheaper and it hedges the rest of my business because maybe I'm implicitly short oil in many different ways. So it's like one of these 
for lack of a better term, Dondo bets. What up, Monish? So David Wilson has a good comment here. Weird he wasn't buying oil two years ago. Not really. I, mean, I, know, I know someone who was buying oil two years ago. I mean, there was I, I think there was a lot of there was a lot of other things going on. And he said, like, I read their their presentation on capital allocation, and that's when yeah, I started to enough. buy. Fair enough. That might be the big difference. Well, I'm sure he's hoping every day that the I'm, I'm sure he'd be just fine if the price of oil came down some and that made the stock puke and yeah. they he could buy more and the company could buy back more. And I'm sure he'd be just happy to own the assets at at lower valuation and maybe even take the whole thing out, as you've speculated, Bill. Uh, my man Francisco made the first speculation. I'm just piggybacking him. I think, uh, what does he want it below 5962 or something? Isn't that where his warrants are from the pref that he uh that he gave them? I thought that's what I saw. I, I might be know. off by the tense, but I know it's 59 something, and I think there's a six. Donald and then Reagan I think says <laughs> probably Oxy it. slides from last <laughs> quarter or two quarters ago said the dividend is sustainable at $40 West Texas Intermediate. That's a pretty good bet, probably. I don't know. Sure, you got yeah. you got nine percent inflation helping you already, right? Right. I was peeping his ten Q man. That the operating businesses are humming right now. Talking about double digit operating growth, uh, operating income growth. Yeah, if you leave out, I, I, and this is true of all all of the conglomerates that sort of fall in that category. You know, the Markells, the Fairfax, the Berkshires. You leave out investment gains and losses out of you know stupid gap and like they're all humming pretty good right now. Yeah, I saw he bought Markel. I wonder how much of it's just like he's like the insurance market is crazy hard right now. I want as much exposure as I can. Oh, I like some Markel guys. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. It's kind of like your own business, you know. Negative oil was the green light. Yeah, that's what I think too. Had to suffer for six months. I think I thought it. I didn't didn't do anything about it. JT actually did. My dumbass. I bought TGS Nopec and I bought Occidental Bonds and I didn't hold. I well, TGS was a loser of an idea and the bonds I didn't <laughs> hold. So good for me. I saw a comment. There was a comment earlier about getting taken out at a. There are a few takeouts now. I've been yeah. I was in I'm um, in uh, Pazina because I like Rich Pazina and I like that business. Not anymore. And, yeah, they got a bid. Not they got gonna, a bid not right gonna own it, it anymore. They got a bid right where it was at the start of the year. Like, yeah. Mm, I bought it thanks. in the last 12 months because it was cheap. So yeah, I agree with them. It's too cheap. I'd take it private too if I if I owned it. Fucking Swedish match is probably the the one thing I've done well over the last 12 months, and Philip Morris steals it from me. It sucks. It sucks. There are some other. That is a weird uh, dynamic that can happen where let's say you buy something and you, you run the risk of actually like becoming pot committed. Like as the price moves further and down, down your risk of a take under increases yeah. and you have to kind of keep buying to then keep your cost basis lower and lower so that you don't get taken under yeah. on your original cost basis. And now all of a sudden you're like way deeper into it than you wanted to be. Don't do it in financials, folks. That's a that's a well, good way well, to blow up. Ask well, well, good, not with, not with wealth management, like a, a quicksand bet or something. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, you, there's you don't want to be doing too much of that anyway. No. Yeah, it's frustrating. I mean, like, good luck to those guys. You don't even, you don't always know you're getting into it though when it starts. Like it's <laughs> yeah. That's why I like how uh, that's although if you're on the other side of somebody like I don't know maybe well I don't criticize by category maybe I won't say this but maybe it. Uh, Rhymes with Rookfield. Uh, you might be <laughs> more worried. Rookfield about. management. Yeah. 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 They'll take you under. They don't care. Um, that's why it's better to just be on the same side of those guys. Could be. But I, I really like uh, Hampton's thoughts on, you know, position sizing and having a max loss for a position and not, you know, he's, he's, uh, wait, every time he talks about going it, into it. Yeah. Yeah. Every time he t talks about like surviving, I think he has very intelligent thoughts. Ted Baker accepted a 20% takeover bid, a, a takeover bid 20% less than a bid they rejected five months ago. Oh, thanks boys. Uh, yeah, good, good job. fellas. Appreciate the service. 
That's the time, amigos. We made it. All right. Have a good one. That was fun. What what do we got? Cheers. It's applause. Uh, I didn't hear it. Didn't didn't come through. Oh, the... Really? That's upsetting. Oh, Bam no. is splitting up the asset manager. That's interesting. Is that true? I tidy that up a little bit. Mm. This was fun. Thanks, yeah. amigos. We'll uh, yeah. we'll be back same. Back